الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين به ونتوكل عليه والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه أجمعين نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يؤتي الحكمة من يشاء ومن يؤتى الحكمة فقد أوتي خيرا كثيرا أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected viewers, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Often in our lives we come across a concept that is universally agreed or is shared amongst people of different faiths, denominations, backgrounds throughout history One of those is wisdom the notion that there are people or groups of individuals that are wise in their statements, are wise in their actions and their decisions. The Islamic teachings of wisdom are quite plentiful as far as the Quran and the Ahl al-Bayt is concerned. And indeed, the first point when we come to discuss this in our examination of the morality of the Ahl al-Bayt and how they were exemplars as far as wisdom is concerned is the idea that Allah wa ta'ala himself is the origin and is the wise being. Allah wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran uses the epithet Al-Hakim, the wise one and Al-Aziz Al-Hakim is used 33 times. The Quran is referred to as the wise book, Al-Quran, Al-Hakim. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of it, the Quran is the actual words of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. What the first realization therefore emerges, and that is this. If we want to be wise, if we want to be considered to be from the hukama, then we must seek it from Allah Taala because He is the source of wisdom, isn't He? So that is the realization. True wisdom, of course, comes from God. But is knowledge, ilm, the same as wisdom? Are they kind of understood interchangeably or are they different terms? Indeed, what is understood out there amongst our ulama, our scholars, having looked at the Quranic presentation of wisdom, al-hikmah, as well as the words of the Ahl al-Bayt. It seems that knowledge is not the same as wisdom. No doubt that's a prerequisite for hikmah. Al-ilm is considered to be a condition in order to obtain knowledge, uh, wisdom, but it's not the same. There isn't really one definition of what wisdom in reality is. Some have said it is the real, true understanding of things. Others have said is when we are stopped or wisdom stops us from acting wrongly. Whilst another group of scholars have understood al-hikmah to mean placing something in its rightful position, where it should be, doing the right thing, saying the right words. Um, a group of scholars have understood hikmah to mean the argument that leads to the truth without doubt. In other words, burhan something which is evidence-based, powerful reasoning. And it is sometimes linked to the word hakam, which means to stop any wrong or corruption. We can perhaps, perhaps, come to an understanding that hikmah is knowledge which is understood, which is useful, which is beneficial, which uh, forms the the basis of the understanding which leads towards righteousness and haq, truth. According to the hadiths of the Ahl al-Bayt the pinnacle of the hikmah, of the wisdom, is God-consciousness, taqwa, is makhafatillah. 
Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallam alayhi in a narration says رأس الحكمة مخافة الله The main thing to start off with, the main essence of hikmah and wisdom is the fear of God, is God consciousness. And that's why you find that those who are truly scholars with wisdom have practiced God consciousness. And that is how you distinguish an individual with knowledge and an individual with wisdom. There are people with knowledge, but not necessarily with wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to have applied the knowledge, but also have infused it with taqwa and God consciousness. There was a man who many, many years ago, according to the narration, was a farmer or somebody who worked in the fields. One day there was a stream of water that was running next to him, next to his farm. He saw an apple and he picked it up. It was kind of flowing on the stream. He started to have the apple. He was hungry, perhaps. But then this power within, which is, you know, God consciousness, started to alert him. Hold on a minute. Maybe this apple belongs to somebody. I didn't seek their permission. How could I just eat it without necessarily seeking permission? Now he made it his objective to investigate the owner of the apple in order to seek permission, in order to somehow be content that he has the permission of the owner. He follows the stream where it has come from and he locates that it's an apple tree that one of the apples had fallen into the stream. He knocks on the door of where the apple tree originates from and the person opens the door. He asks him, are you the owner of the house? He said, yes. He said, well, you know, there's a tree that you have, which is apple, and one of it fell on the particular uh, stream, and I had it, and therefore I'd like to seek your pardon, your permission, or I would pay you for it. The individual said, I would, but I don't own the entire tree. I own only half of it. He said, very well, what is the situation? He said, the other half is owned by an individual who lives in Isfahan in Iran, which is quite a bit of a distance from the area that he was living, perhaps in Ahwaz, maybe one or two days worth of travel. And if you want to seek permission, you have to travel there. At that time, there was no means, you know, no emails, no messages, no telephones, so you can't really call. This is where most people would have perhaps ended their interest in seeking the owner because they said it's an apple i've sought half of it maybe the other half the person will forgive me maybe i'll seek forgiveness from god or maybe i don't worry about it but there are degrees and this individual had reached that level of taqwa that he would do everything possible to ensure that he's not committing a sin so he made the journey towards the city of Aswahan, seeking the owner of the co-owner of the apple tree in which the apple fell from. When he reached that area and he knocked on the door of that person, he was met by the individual who confirmed that he owned half of the tree, but he refused to give him permission. Despite the journey, despite the willingness to come and seek that permission, the co-owner said, I'm sorry, I can't give you permission, except if you were to do something for me. He said, what is it? He said, I would like you to marry my daughter. Strange. What has this got to do with it? Well, he said, you know, my daughter is blind, my daughter is uh, deaf, and she's dumb. And she's quite disabled. So, if you would marry her, then I would accept and would agree with regards to this idea. Now, even to this level, if people had reached this level, this is a point where they turned back. They had come for permission of half a tree, now he's been asked to marry someone. But again, an individual who wants God will not allow any obstacles before him. So he agrees. But to his shock at that night or a night of his wedding, he finds when he first sees his wife, he has not met her before, he sees that she's perfectly healthy. She can see, she can speak, and she can hear. And 
she's not disabled. He asks his father-in-law, what is going on? He said, well, you know, this daughter of mine, I said to you, is blind. She's blind from haram. She's never seen anything haram. She's deaf from hearing anything haram. She's never gone to anything haram. She doesn't speak anything haram. And I wanted someone who has real taqwa to marry her. And because I saw in you that journey you've made in order to seek permission, you're the right person to marry her. And from this relationship, we are told, a son was born. He became a great marja, a taqlid Ayatullah al-Muqaddis al-Ardabili, radhwanullahi ta'ala alayhi, one of our great marja, who's buried in the courtyard of Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam a great scholar within the school of Ahl al-Bayt. But you can see that that effort brings about wisdom, that effort brings about that uh, hikmah that people are seeking. This direct correlation with God and sincerity is also established. The hadith of the Ahl al-Bayt says, مَنْ أَخْلَصَ لِلَّهِ أَرْبَعِينَ صَبَاحًا جَرَتْ يَنَابِعُ الْحِكْمَةِ مِنْ قَلْبِهِ إِلَى لِسَانِهِ Whomsoever observes sincerity of God for 40 mornings, or in other words, 40 days, will see the uh, hikmah, wisdom, oozing from their heart towards their tongue. Therefore, sincerity is deemed to be another prerequisite to attaining wisdom and um, hikmah. We are told a great deal of perseverance, humility, patience, hunger, silence, and forgiveness. This is all needed with regards to the um, seeking of the uh, wisdom. In the Holy Quran, Allah wa Taala gives uh, the kind of instruction as to what is um, the purposefulness of wisdom in our day-to-day -day lives, especially in the West, when we live with others who may not necessarily share our faith or may disagree with us or may object to us and so on and so forth. Allah Taala says, اِدْعُوا إِلَىٰ سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمُوْعِذَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ Call to the way of Allah with wisdom. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whomsoever is given wisdom, فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا is given abundant greatness. Why? Because there is a opportunity to utilize it. There is a uh, possibility to um, benefit from the wisdom in our day-to-day -day experiences. Invite to the path of your Lord, without any coercing, without necessarily force, um, through the idea of hikmah, which is a combination of powerful intellectual reasoning, and mu'adat al-hasana, which is applying to the heart to be soft-spoken. Allah Taala, when it came to Prophet Musa السلام, when he was coming to speak to Fir'aun, he said to him, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا uh, Speak with uh, Fir'aun in a soft manner so that it appeals, you know, so that it penetrates his heart. That is important. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنَ Hikmah is told here as in a very effective tool of persuasion, of getting people to understand what is it that we are saying. You know, saying the right things with knowledge, with understanding, is of great importance. And we have examples of how those close to the Ahl al-Bayt, how they utilize wisdom in their day-to-day -day speech and their communication, even with their enemies. You have Sa'id ibn Jubayr, radhwanullahi ta'ala alayhi. He was, uh, 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 you know, somebody who was close to the Imam, such as Imam Zayn al-Abideen, alayhi salam, and Imam al-Baqir, alayhi salam. Uh, the wretched, bloodthirsty governor of Iraq, Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, he captured Sa'id ibn Jubair. 
And when he captured him, he asked him, uh, what is your name? Sa'id said, Ana Sa'id ibn Jubair. Hajjaj said, no. Bal anta Shaqi ibn Kasir. The opposite. You are the wretched, the son of the broken one. Sa'id said, my mother is more knowledgeable in terms of naming me. In other words, she didn't name me this. She's more knowledgeable than this. Hajjaj said, may you be wretched and your mother remain wretched. Look at the terminology of the enemies of the Ahl al-Bayt and look at the ones who were schooled under the Ahl al-Bayt, their akhlaq, their mannerism, how superb it is, even to their enemies. And they would really infuriate the enemies with their wisdom, with their kindness, with their speech. Uh, Sa'id would say, the wretched ones, Sa'id ibn Jubayr reply and say, the wretched ones are the ones with the people of hell. They are the worst, you know, the wretched ones. Hajjaj would say, I will change your dunya to hell. Sa'id rep rep replies, says, if I knew that this is in your hands, I would have worshipped you. If you, can, if you say you can change my dunya to hell, then I would have worshipped you. Uh, Hajjaj said, then said to him, then choose a way in which you are killed. How would you like to be killed? Said says, yeah, you, can, you, you will have to choose that because you're the one who is perpetrating this particular crime, in other words. Uh, the following what happened was that Said would then smile and say, uh, and, and Hajjaj would say, why are you smiling? And uh, Said would say, I smile from uh, your audacity against God. And how God has what has given you time on this earth, you know, to live and to, to, to commit these things. And at that moment, Sa'id would recite what Jahtu Wajhi Samawati Wal I turn towards God who has created the heavens and the earth. And look, and even in the final moments, Hajjat says to him, Remove your face from the qibla. And Sa'id said, فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ He recited the verse that says, wherever you turn, you'll find God. And then he said, اللهم لا تسلطه على أحد بعدي يا الله Don't make him overpowering anyone after me. And he was executed. He attained martyrdom. Fifteen days later, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi would say, ما لي وسعيد, ما لي وسعيد. Why did I do this with Sa'id? He would twist here and there in his sleep, he would be somehow tortured until he died. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished him eventually in this world and the hereafter. Hikmah is a hallmark of the companions of the Ahl al-Bayt because they learnt it from the Ma'sumin. Peace and blessings be upon them themselves. There was a, uh, an individual by the name of Sham ibn al-Hakam, a very well known companion of Imam al-Sadiq and Imam Musa al-Kadhim salawatullahi wa salam alayhim ajma'in. And he had great wisdom in his debates when it comes to those whom he disagreed with. One of them is Abdullah ibn Yazid al-Abadi who was the head of the Kharijites at that time. Abdullah ibn Yazid used to say, well, the Kharijites are right. We are the Kharijites, their methodology, their arguments. They would be advocating them. They would be supporting that particular ideology of the Kharijites. And Hujam ibn Hakam used wisdom and intellectual reasoning in order to defeat this particular individual. How did he defeat him? The moment they came to debate each other, Husam said, Husham said to Abdullah, he said to him, well, how are, going, are we going to know who is the victorious in the debate? Who has won the debate? Uh, Abdullah ibn Yazid said, well, let's have somebody who will be the judge. Husham ibn Hakim said, the problem with that is that individual will either be biased towards me or towards you. They may not necessarily be unbiased. So Abdullah ibn Yazid said, fine, let's have one person who is from your side and one person from my side, yes, to be the judges, the arbiters. Hisham al-Hakam immediately said, I have become victorious. I have defeated you already in your own understanding. He said, how? 
He said, this is exactly what happened in Safin. Yes, Imam Ali alayhi salam was against this tahkim arbitration. But the Khawarij themselves called for this. One person from Imam Ali's side, one person from Muawiyah's side. Exactly how this Abdullah ibn Yazid is saying, you know, uh, to, to do. But the problem is, the Khawarij later turned against Imam Ali and said that was wrong. They said you should not have allowed that to happen. Despite the fact that they the ones who wanted it, but they turned to Imam Ali and said, you must seek repentance. So here, uh, Usham al-Hakim is saying to Abdullah al-Yazid, your, your ideology is the one who advocated this. And despite then later on saying, no, it's wrong, you are also applying it again. So he became victorious in the very clever method in this particular way. Similarly, we have our scholars who developed this type of uh, thinking and wisdom learning from the Ahl al-Bayt in their debates. One of them is of course Shaykh al-Mufid Shaykh al-Mufid one day was uh, attending a class in Basra by an individual by the name of Ali ibn Isa al roman This Ali ibn Isa was giving uh, lessons or was giving a sermon or a particular uh, teachings and he then said this he said that we take the battle uh, sorry we take the incident of the cave to be uh, more established than the incident of Ghadir we take it like that why when he was asked he said well you know the incident of Ghadir is narrated but the incident of the Ghar, Ghar cave is when the Prophet and uh, the first Khalif Abu Bakr they went together apparently according to the narrations from Mecca to Medina so he said the incident of the cave is established in the Quran but the incident of, narr of Ghadir is not is narration uh, Sheikh Mufid lifted his hands and said can I ask you what is uh, the ruling of the individual who goes against the imam of the time? The khalif or the God's chosen imam. He said, they are kafir. They die kafir. If they die in this state, they are kafir. They are non-believers. Yes. Or they are infidels. They are fasiq and infidels. He said, can you tell me about Talha and Zubair, the two companions of the Prophet who were killed in the battle of Jamal fighting Imam Ali. They went against the Imam of the time, isn't it? What is the ruling with regards to them? He said, oh, but they sought repentance. He replies, and Sheikh Al-Mufid said, the fact that somebody goes against the, time, the, the, the Imam of the time and is a fasiq and is an infidel is what? Recognized and established. The idea that they sought repentance is narrated so we take that which is established over that which is narrated. He used the same mentality, but that is wisdom. Through that he was able to... So, so the, then Ali ibn Isa called him and said, Who are you? You are surely Mufid. And that's where the title Mufid, meaning a very beneficial person, was given to the great Sheikh. And therefore, those around the Ahl al-Bayt utilized that method of debate of understanding how to uh, get across the message in the wisest possible manner. Today, in this day and age, when we are facing increasing Islamophobia, when we are facing Shiaophobia, when we are facing uh, criticism and people have some kind of um, misunderstanding, a lot of misconceptions about the religion of Islam, more than ever we need to apply wisdom in the way we speak, in the way we communicate, in the way we present the religion of Islam uh, to the Western world. Uh, wisdom here requires a great deal of understanding of what to say, when to say it, how to present it, in which way to communicate. It is not about just saying everything in the way that we used to. It is not about just verbatim and just getting it out. No, it needs to be measured. 
It needs to be with the understanding of the mentality of the people that we are talking to. So for example, when we talk about Imam Hussein alayhi salam and the epic eternal message of Karbala, when we speak about the personality of Yazid, how do we present Yazid to non-Muslims or those who will be trying to explain why Imam Hussein alayhi salam stood against him? If we say Yazid was drunkard and a womanizer, I say, well, you know, that in itself is not necessarily in their view a bad thing. But for us, we have to present this idea more of a universal battle of justice against falsehood. More of the idea of seeking righteousness, seeking freedom, the uh, noble uh, element of uh, standing against oppression, and the killing of innocent civilians, and the rights of people, giving people rights. Those are more acceptable universal values that we can speak about. It's about how we communicate it, how we present it. And so it is needed today. Those who are in the public arena, the scholars, the leaders, even people, laymen and women, uh, the Muslim community, general, and then the Muslim community, the Shia, they need to be having wisdom in their day-to-day -day interactions and how they represent themselves to the outside world in order that they implement the teachings of the Qur'an as applied by the Ahlul Bayt salam, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اِدْعُوا إِلَىٰ سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ Invite people to Allah by using hikmah, by wisdom and good counsel, intellectual arguments. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow that upon us, that we follow in the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt, we seek inspiration from the companions of the Ahlul Bayt who understood exactly how to approach this area. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلِّ لَهُمْ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ الطَّيِّبِينَ الطَّاهِرِينَ Ooh, ooh, ooh.